Hey there, and welcome to Queer I Am Lord, a brand new show where two or more gather together to Kiki in God's name. I'm Jorge Olivares of HeyJorge.com, and today I'm joined by fellow Catholic Jackie Osterblad. Now, Jackie is currently attending Yale Law School, getting her degree there, previously went to the University of Arizona, and is from that area, so it'll be curious to get her take on what it's like to discover one's sexuality and spirituality in a place in the South where might not seem to be the most welcoming. I say that as somebody from Texas. Um, But I'm curious to see kind of where she is now, this journey that she's been on. It might not look the same as as your or my own. So I'm glad to hear from herself just what it's like to live within the intersection of these two very great identities. But the one thing I do want to say, and I've noticed this with a lot of the people that I'm having these conversations with, because they are happening via Zoom, I love that Jackie has a really wonderful pride flag right in the background, just to show you that she's incredibly comfortable and very much forthright with who she is. Um, So Jackie, thank you so much for joining me and for, for having this very open dialogue about what it's like to be a queer Catholic today. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having me. The pride flag has to cover the stationary bike. (laughs) Hey, but it it has two purposes, right? Yeah, exactly. It's It's actually doing what it needs to do, but it's also very much showing the world that you're incredibly proud of who you are. Um, You told me that this is the background, the background that I see you now with the Zoom conversation. It's the background you've had um, for the past little while. Um, I love that that the flag is there because Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't necessarily show it off in the, in the way that they might really want to. Um, so let's talk about that and talk about how you're in a position to be able to do that and, and kind of not be fearful of showing people that you have a pride flag. Yeah, I don't, um, you know, I'm at Yale, which is um, kind of known as the gay Ivy. So I have to say, I don't get a lot of, you know, <laughs> it's not unexpected to see a pride flag in the background yeah. of my classes <laughs> at all. Interesting. Uh, I had no idea. Yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm the, I'm the president of the LGBTQ student group at the law school. So I also feel like, you know, I should zoom into class with, with my pride flag, but I, I leave it up when I zoom into church too. So, you know. Ooh, nice. So let's talk a little bit about, um, before we get into the, being the president of the LGBTQ group, because I think that's such a wonderful calling um, that some people have. And I think it's really cool to kind of take this leadership position for other people who really want to show to the world exactly who they are. Um, But so you've been doing Zoom masses over the past few months? No, so I guess um, I should say when I Zoom into like church meetings, so like I'm on the Graduate Student Council, so we have like Zoom meetings to plan things or, um, you know, we a lot of social events um, on Zoom, but masses, you know, very much... I don't think, I think the Catholics have mostly done the YouTube thing. That's, that's been <laughs> my experience. Not a lot of participation required. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Was there any hesitation? Like, let's say you were to zoom into mass. Would you remove the pride flag? Would you be excited about having the pride flag? Would you maybe move the pride flag a little bit closer to the camera? So it's kind of um, front and center for people to see. Um, I just think that's such a, a really cool way to subtly tell the world, like, hi, not only am I here, but I'm probably not the only one. Yeah, no, I keep, I, I keep it up when I call into, yeah, our church does a lot of things every week that I show up to, um, and, I, and I always leave it up. What, is, what has been your introduction to Catholicism? Because I, I think um, being able to do that comes from a place of comfortability, not only with who they are as a queer person, but their comfortability as a Catholic and saying, like, I'm pretty much the same as everybody else who's here in that I want to express my faith in the form that has been known to me since the beginning of my life. Um, Is that something that, like, were you a mass going person when you were younger? Was that something that was kind of ingrained in you that this was a very significant part of, of spiritual expression? What was that? What did that look like? Yeah, I was raised Catholic, um, but kind of in a weird way. Like my, um, my mom was not particularly religious and my, and I'm an only child. So my mom was not particularly religious. My stepdad was not religious at all. Um, but like my grandma and the extended family were all Catholic. So my mom didn't have me baptized when I was a baby, but we, 
went to mass and my grandma made sure I got baptized before I turned seven because she didn't want me to be considered an adult convert. She was like very <laughs> so that she can go through the classes with her classmates. Um, so I, you know, Catholicism was like there, but it wasn't necessarily at home, right? Like my family wasn't like praying at home or like there weren't icons around my house, but you went to grandma's house, there were Mary's everywhere. Um, when I got to like middle and high school, I really took the faith, like that was my thing. Like I was going to be the religious person in the family. Um, and I think that was a little bit inflected by um, like the part of Arizona I grew up in was not very Catholic. Um, we had the one Catholic parish and everyone there was a retiree. Like my confirmation class was like four people, um, but it was very evangelical. And so that like bled into our Catholicism too. Like it was very, it had a very similar flavor. Um, and so I was, I was always the Catholic kid, but like that, like religious revivalism, you know, I'm going to, you know, um, be really into Jesus as a 13 year old, I think was modeled on my peers who went to mountain Bible. Um, yeah. I, I think it's so interesting when we talk about people's respective introductions to Catholicism, or at least the Catholicism that they might even carry with them today. And I appreciate you talking about this influence of evangelicalism, because it is something that I have no complete understanding of whatsoever. But yet that doesn't change the fact that you and I, in this particular moment in this conversation, still very much identify as Catholic. Um, so if you can maybe just talk a little bit and expand a little bit more about these influences that you were talking about, like where it's you know, at 13, being the Jesus girl and doing all the, <laughs> the sorts of things that uh, one would attach to, to what they might assume is the case with evangelicalism. Yeah, um, I don't quite know how to explain it, um, except that I just think a lot of the culture warrior stuff of the 90s, the same like Christian music and the same books in a lot of ways. Um, and like, I went to specifically like Catholic weekend camps, but they were very much like, let's play rock music, um, praise and worship style and like, mm. like these games, you know, it was like a lot of things that like I knew had been stolen from my friends Bible camps, but now like they were mixed in and like there happened to be mass. Um, it, so I just, um, I think a lot of things about uh, things that I would consider traditional Catholicism that I've found as I've gotten older, like just weren't, there was not a lot of Latin and incense going around when I was growing up in the church. Um, and those, or even just like the image, like people would talk about their faith in a way that like was palatable to the evangelicals. It made us seem like we were all in this together because we all were, we were all together fighting against abortion and gay marriage, right? That was the mm -hmm. line. <laughs> uh, what was some of the what were some of the the things that you were hearing in these particular spaces? Whether it was the strictly Catholic space, whether it was this weird binary space of Catholicism mixed in with evangelicalism, like what were some of the queer things that you were hearing that maybe influenced what you were thinking about your own sexuality? Um, or maybe even pushed off what you were thinking about your own sexuality. What were some of those, those, what was that rhetoric? What did it sound like? Yeah, I think a lot of the, um, you know, what I was introduced to as apologetics was how to explain to peers at a public school why, why the church opposed same-sex marriage, right? Like it would go, like it was those same, like, um, here are 10 questions you can expect to get from the world and here are the answers from the catechism because things are, you know, there are clear questions and clear answers. Um, I definitely had like at least three different theology of the body for teens books too. So <laughs> I learned <laughs> all about how this wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just something like plucked, plucked out of a couple of Bible verses, but it was like explained to me as, um, you know, the nuclear family mirroring the Trinity in this way that was so in like in like Catholicism was built around it in a way that if you pulled on this thread, everything would unravel. Mm. Um, and, I be and I believed that um, such that when I realized I was queer, I think I, I, I had a, it was a mix of at first thinking that 
I, that the church was still true, but I just couldn't do it. I was just not willing to do it. I was, you know, but I didn't ask the church to change for me because it was still this, if I pulled on that thread, it would all fall apart. And so it wouldn't, what would be the point? But eventually when I realized like, no, they were just lying, then I was like, well, then the whole thing was a lie because they told me that you can't pull this thread without the whole thing falling apart. So I pulled that thread, the whole thing fell apart. So you were approaching it as if there's at first, like if there was an ultimatum, a spiritual ultimatum, Mm -hmm. either you choose your queerness because this is right or completely renounce your sexuality, continue to follow God in the way that you thought you were called to follow. um, And then, kind of have to be okay with whatever decision you made? Yeah, I, yeah, I think at first I thought it was an ultimate, it was an ultimatum, like straight from God, like, you know, choose one of these two things. But eventually it made me think that God wasn't real because I had been told that, that if God was real, then that meant that queerness was wrong. Like there was such like a proof between the two mm-hmm. that when yeah. I was part of it, then yeah. I, I kind of want to focus a little bit on this idea of like, once you understand that queerness is, is at the center of who you are, maybe not at the center, I don't want to project that, but that center, uh, that queerness factors into your life in more of a way than you probably knew beforehand. Talk about that, that kind of st- that internal struggle, or maybe even an external struggle with the church when you're just thinking, all right, that's wrong. It unraveled. I could give two shits anymore. Um, because I am approaching this as somebody who never had that, that debate w- between mm-hmm. myself. Um, so kind of share that if you will. Yeah, I think this is part of where I see the evangelical inflection looking back because it was so literal. I, I think I had intellectualized my faith so much as opposed to like experiencing the mystery of God that an, an intellectual hole in the proof could make me just be like, well, it's, you know, then I'm, then I'm, it's not real. Or if it's real, I don't belong in it. One of those two, either way, I'm out of here. And I actually found it, I was very good at being an agnostic. Like I didn't have, like the first couple months were really hard, but it was mostly because of I felt like choosing my faith had been like the first adult decision I had made because it was was something I was choosing to do different from my family. And so I felt like a crisis of identity in that sense, but I actually didn't feel like a huge crisis about God for a while um, because I think my faith was just so immature and it was immature because it had been given to me as a set of, of rules and proofs and theorems. I really love and appreciate that you talk about maturity in this particular way, because I never would have used that language to talk about faith. Like our faith matures. And when we start off, we think we have all the answers that God's in heaven. There's a hell. If you sin, if you do all sorts of things and you're not going to win favor with the Lord, like, and, and somehow, even as, as young kids, we have this adult understanding of what, Spirituality is meant to be. So I love the beauty in saying that we mature in our faith, that our faith as an entity matures in and of itself. I think that's such a cool way to to understand the journey that a lot of us are on, where it's like, we don't have the answers. And even now we're probably still not figuring it out because we have to allow our faith to even reach the heights in which it's going to reach. Um, In believing a God who you understand as much as him, like what, what's, the point in a God that's only as big as your own head. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. That is such a cool way to say that. Um, You did mention the fact that you are an only child. And when you came to this point where you were, you were debating about your attachment to the church or just your attachment to God or the divine, um, was that a very difficult conversation to have with your family or were they a little more open to kind of allowing you to see what fit? Yeah. um, Unfortunately, I didn't get to have the conversation with my family because my mom read my journal and outed me, um, sort of confronted me about it. Um, And I don't know if it was because of that, like orientation in which we were having that conversation or if it would have happened anyway, but no, it it did not go well and it has not gone well. Um, And something I find kind of interesting is that my, my mom sort of became 
the kind of religious that I was as a teenager, like looking, like she went looking for answers from the church and has now become like a very interestingly literal homophobe of the church variety. Um, so I think, I think those, I, I understand the comfort of those simple answers because they used to be mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate you sharing that and, and thank you for doing so. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about that understanding and the revelation of queerness mm -hmm. because I think, I mean, it could, depending on who we are and our lived experiences, it could be either the most enlightening thing or it can be the most stressful, scary thing to ever happen. Um, how would you describe that arrival? And do you kind of look back on it fondly? I do. I think, I think I was lucky. I think part of the reason it was so easy for me to fairly quickly choose myself and um, my love over um, the lies I had been given was that I, you know, I, I, I had crushes looking back, but I have to look back to see them. I didn't recognize them at the time. The revelation only really, like I fell in love fairly quickly after coming out. Um, and so I think having like actual love to compare it to was like, oh, okay, this is, um, you know, this is what I was told God was supposed to be like. I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that's how you witness the intersection between spirituality and sexuality by, by understanding love and seeing how love could, could present itself to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, looking back, doing the self-rationalizing that we do afterwards, but not at the time. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think when I thought I was walking away from the church, I was walking towards God because I was walking towards this incredibly important relationship that he had put into my life. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, if God is love, then the way that we are most created in the image and likeness of God is the way that we love. Um, and I think, you know, the other... God is also reveals himself to us in stories. Like one of the ways that we are most like God is our ability to like tell, tell narratives about our life. Um, so I think both of those things are, are ways that queerness have helped me see, see who God is more. I think I, I wanna take what you just said about the narratives that are, or, that are associated with God mm -hmm. and the storytelling that comes with God. And I also want to tie it to this idea of the unknown. And mm -hmm. like, there's so much queerness to be found in those two themes, right? Like the storytelling that comes with queerness, where a lot of us love to tell our stories, the purpose of this podcast for us to tell our stories. Like we love telling people who we are because it was such a hard fought journey to get to be able to even tell people who we are, and let alone tell ourselves who we are. And the other about the unknown, like, when you come out as queer, especially if you don't have relatives who are queer, if you have nobody in your life who's queer, you're stepping into the unknown and just like, life, help me figure this out. And I think that's the beauty of Catholicism and faith is that a lot of it is unknown. We're kind of just flying by the seat of our pants, going with things that we were told when we were little and just like taking it at face value. And I think there's something very cool about that. And in I'm sure not many people make that connection about the unknown being something that is rooted in queerness, but I think it very much is. I think a lot of us don't know what we're doing and we're just kind of trucking along and thinking, oh, I'll figure this out at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're telling stories that we don't know the end to. And we're sort of looking the whole time, we're just you know looking for what is good in along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about that, about, about finding what is good along the way. Um, at what point did you realize that maybe good could be found in faith and spirituality, um, even though it might not look like the faith and spirituality that you were exposed to as a, as a younger kid? Hmm. Yeah, I think it was a long process, obviously. I think it is for most people. Um, you know, I think only saints get you know, like zapped by lightning and suddenly believe in God. Um, <laughs> but I, so I took, there was a series of things that happened over like my fourth year in college. I spent five years. So I was, I have to, I can't just say <laughs> senior year. <laughs> um, I like, I took classes on both. I took a class on Jewish civilization and I took a class on Islamic mysticism. And so I was reading a lot of books about God 
sort of in other dialects, right? So I was like, oh, this is interesting, like to think about God in this way, but this isn't the language I would have chosen. And it just gave me like a different, I think it opened me up to God language for the first time in a while, but it also made me recognize like how much my vocabulary about God had been shaped by Catholicism and how Catholic I still was in certain ways. Um, and then a friend recommended a book to me and I still don't know why she recommended it to me because I was not, very, I was not Christian at the time. Um, it was a, a, a mentor um, and it was Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited. And then about a week after she sent me the Facebook message saying that I needed to read this book, that she reminded her of me, she died. And so then I was like, well, now I actually have to read this book. Oh my God. <laughs> I, at the time, I like took the recommendation, like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll read that eventually. But I, you know, and so I read Howard Thurman. Um, and that was also my first time seeing like real Christianity, not, you know, I had been raised as a, as a, um, I don't know, kind of as a conservative Christian to think that all the people who were liberal and Christian was because they watered down their Christian theology. <laughs> but here was a guy who like took Christian theology seriously and was like, no, like, you know, oppression is a sin. Oppression is the sin. Um, so I, I, I started to see that Christianity could be used in other ways and that my vocabulary was still shaped by, by Christianity. But that didn't get me there because I was still like, oh, that's interesting. I'm culturally Christian, but I don't believe in God. So where's this going to go? You know, but I, I, I had this idea that I wanted to reclaim my faith in the sort of ritual and tradition sense. Right? I wanted the same right to show up to mass only on Ash Wednesday that every other Catholic had. Right. I wanted mm, to do that mm -hmm. little chicken every year, um, but be like, I don't really believe in God, but man, ashes are nice. Um, <laughs> I love the idea of mortality and that being yeah. kind of smudged on my face to remind me every so often. Yeah, I mean, those, those were ideas that had come from, from those classes about Judaism and Islam too, that, that you could, you know, belong to these things in a cultural sense and still struggle with the idea of God. Um, and then I, I, spent that, I spent the next summer working in a refugee camp in Lebanon. Um, and first of all, in, in Lebanon, there are, you know, saint shrines on like every corner like you go around beirut and it's like oh there's saint anthony again um <laughs> and so that you know was again like this idea of like cultural catholicism of sort of you know surrounding your your space with these ideas um but anyway i you know i like to go to religious services when i'm abroad um it's, it's, it's nice when you can't understand the language all the way actually <laughs> you have to just like sit there and like be um and so on my, on my last, I was having a lot of conflicts to begin with working in a refugee camp about like good and evil and how small humans were and what we were supposed to be doing with problems like this. Um, and I, I finally got up early enough to go to mass on my, my last Sunday there because I'd been meaning to go to a Maronite mass. Um, and most of a Maronite mass is in Aramaic, but they read the the readings in Arabic so that people will understand them. And I had enough Arabic to understand what, you know, what the gospel reading was. Um, and the priest opens it up and starts reading. And it is, I was, I was in the refugee camp I was in was in Tyre, Lebanon. And he opens it up and he starts reading about the Syro Syrophoenician woman in Tyre, Lebanon. And how she, you know, follows after God, after Jesus, begging him to, to, to heal her daughter. Um, and the apostles tell him to send her away. And Jesus has that really combative, weird conversation where he like refers to her as a, as a dog and she keeps persisting and says like, even dogs get to eat the bread, the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And I like felt like someone just begging for scraps. I felt like I'd spent the summer surrounded by people who were just begging for scraps. And I felt like God had called me a dog, had turned me away, had turned us away. And so I don't understand that reading. I still don't understand that reading. It's a complicated idea of, it, it, it had all of my complicated emotions about God in it. But in the end, her daughter gets healed. And in the end, she gets bred. And I took communion, that mass for the first time. I had stumbled into mass a couple of times. You know, I'd shown up at Christmas with family and stuff, but I hadn't taken communion in five and a half years or something at that point. And I took communion that time because it felt like, God was telling me to stop 
believing these rules about who was and wasn't entitled to the bread from the table. I think the most beautiful part about growing up and the maturation of faith and who we are is understanding that there are no rules, right? Like if, if I want to get communion because I feel so called to do it, I can do it. Mm-hmm. Even if you think that I'm engaging in the most sinful of behaviors, like it is my right as a, a self-proclaimed Catholic to be able to do that because it is, I am invited to, the seat, uh, to a seat at the table. I was told at my baptism that I am invited and I am considered to be in, created in the image and likeness of God. And so who am I to prevent myself from taking what's rightfully mine? Mm-hmm. So I, I love that. I think that is such a beautiful way to, to allow people to say, like, it is entirely normal for me to want to do things that you do, even if you think that I'm approaching it in a different way than you would, the way you would. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to focus a little bit on, because you brought it up a couple times in this most recent answer you gave about the vocabulary of God. Mm-hmm. And so I want to ask you about the vocabulary in which you use to either describe God to yourself today um, that you use to describe yourself to God? Like, what does that vocabulary look like? Mm. I mean, one thing that I mean when I talk about, like, my vocabulary of God being so deeply Christian is just that I really find the concept of the Trinity useful um, in understanding God as love and our relationships as an image of God. Um, so that's one way, but I feel like you're asking me something a little deeper that I don't know the answer to, (laughs) you know, I don't, I don't. That's fair. That's absolutely fair. I, um, you know, I, I don't, I guess I think one of the things that most of us probably who believe in God love about God is that we don't have to use words to describe ourselves to him, right? Like you just get to sit and not have to justify or explain your existence. As beautiful as stories are, it's really nice actually to have one person in your life that you don't have to tell your story to. Because we have to do it our, the rest of our entire lives. Like we're always constantly coming out to folks. It's like, yes, I'm queer. Oh, yes, that means and all <laughs> the things that come from that. But it's like, nope, God knew from the very beginning and I don't have to constantly say anything about who I am because I am who I am because mm-hmm. the Lord made it so. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of want to go back to the flag that's in your room right now mm-hmm. um, because I think a lot of us have certain attachments to either the pride flag, those colors, um, depending on our journey into accepting those colors for what they are. So I, you did mention that you are the president of the LGBTQ organization tied to the law school that you're a part of now, correct? Mm-hmm. Um, talk about the importance of doing something like that and embracing those colors and embracing that flag and kind of now using it to connect with others who share similar backgrounds? I love spending time in the queer community because as similar, like, it's funny because you describe it as similar backgrounds, but I find it to be like the most diverse rooms that I'm ever in, right? Like that just everyone is so odd in wonderful, (laughs) lovely ways. Um, Yeah, they're just my... Queers are my favorite people to be in community with um, and not because it makes me feel at home in that sense of like everyone being the same, but because it challenges me because everyone is, is, is something brand new to me um, and has a a totally unexpected story to me. Um, And I, I don't know that I've actually spent a whole lot of time in like pure queer spaces in the past. Um, and so it, it was important to me when I got to the law school and there was this really robust LGBT community that just like likes to hang out together that I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to commit to that. I'm going to do that. Nice. Are you looking forward to the time where we did talk a little bit about for some church events, whether mass or not mass related, that the flag is there, people can see it. Like, are you somebody who looks forward to the opportunity to, have a pride flag or have some sort of pride, um, pride colored 
thing on you when you go to mass in a physical sense? Or is that something that you just don't care to do? I, um, I made one of my, my good friends at, um, at STM at my church because I happened to show up to, there was like a grad student welcome mass, like my third week here um, on a weekday. And I showed up in my pride shirt and he was like, sat down next, he's not gay, but he was like, anyone who shows up to a mass in a, in a pride shirt is going to be my person. Um, Cause yeah, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't do it in certain churches. I'm not actually that person. I'm not intending to be antagonistic, um, but I do, I like to do it in churches that like to think of themselves as liberal, but prefer that things be quiet, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I, I don't want people to, to pat themselves on the back for being a, a safe place and think that that means that they don't have to then see us, right? Like being a safe place means that you're gonna like know that you're sharing space with queers and that, and that should, should make you happy. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that saying. Sometimes you got to say the quiet things out loud and mm -hmm. that might not be vocally. It could be with other things that you do, just shirts that we wear, clothes that we wear, um, presentations of how we just present ourselves to the world. I think that's such a beautiful part of the ministry and the vocation that we're all called to do. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie, for joining me to talk about this. And if you feel so comfortable to share, how can folks follow you on social media um, if that's something that you'd like? Oh, I don't know my social media. What is it? My Twitter is, <laughs> uh, I think it's Jay Osterblad, but no one's going to know how to spell my last name, which is totally fair because it's a, it's a doozy. That is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, if anything, I, we will always be able to tag you on our social media, which for those who are listening, you can follow us at Hey Jorge, H-E-Y-X-O-R-J-E, -E, or me personally at Jorge O, X-O-R-J-E-O. -E uh, but Jackie, this is so much fun. And I want to end by saying peace be with you. And also with you.